Well, hello everybody, my name is John Rin, and uh, I drive a garbage truck for the human genome, that's right. <laughs> you might, it's the best job in the world, and you might be thinking, what, how does one get this job? Well, for me, it took a long, strong CV of failure. I failed as a kid, I was a terrible kid, bad at school. I skateboarded and snowboarded, those are my life's passions, and uh, you're always in a scuffle or a tuffle with a security guard or a ski patrol, and this never works out well. It's a recipe for failure. And I proved it over and over again to myself. And throughout this process, and 10 broken bones and three cracked heads uh, later, I realized that there's, a, there's another group that can get away with this. They run around, they look for rules, they even try and throw twists on rules, and they don't get in trouble, and they fail all the time. In fact, they are encouraged to fail. It's scientists. And I really identified uh, with this group um, and, and became fascinated by this question I want to talk to you guys about today, the human genome. Just take a second about what that means to you, because it's a very bizarre term. But it's the fabric that's in every single cell in your body. And it, it's the shape that this template takes, whether you get a brain cell, a liver cell, or a kidney cell. And so the human genome was about to be sequenced when I was a graduate student. There was this pie that was essentially just going to fall right out of the sky and tell us the answer to all these questions. And this was so cool, um, a new, new skate park, if you will, to go and uh, play in. And so we did this, but the answer was kind of a bummer. The answer was, we're only using 2%. What the, really, 2%? This, this amazing, you talk about resilience. I didn't know what resilience meant before this meeting, but I do now. This thing's resilient. Um, and it's, it's only using 2%, it's coasting at this rate. It seemed unlikely, but the thing was that conventional wisdom told you not to look, this is not the pie you want to eat. And the reason we looked at that that way is because we looked at it through this lens. And sing along if you know this from Biology 101, that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And it's these protein genes that people were really intrigued by, and that's that 2% um, that are in there. But if you look at this just slightly different, and just in case you didn't get that, this is my one movie, uh, <laughs> old school. Um, if you look at this just slightly different, just a slight change in the uh, perspective, you get this. You get the rest of the pie. Now that's the kind of pie I want to I go after. And I became in completely intrigued by who is to say that this is all junk? No way. And so I was relegated to the wastelands of the human genome. <laughs> As a graduate student, I spent five years here suffering, failing, building new tools, doing exciting things. And what we found is there is life all over the genome. And it was a really, really exciting thing. It was almost as if you can think of this dirt. There was just RNA everywhere. It was emerging all over the place. And it even looked like little trees and shrubs and off in the distance. It looked like real genes. And this was great. I wrote up my PhD thesis and I handed it in. Failure. It's still junk. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's important. That's fair enough, right? We should figure out what it's doing. So we did that. And I was lucky enough to find another advisor who didn't think it was completely nuts. And we used skin. And why skin it was the big clue for us. And skin is the coolest organ in the body. It covers your entire body, yet always has sites of specialization, such that hair will hopefully never grow on the palm of your hand, but will always grow on top of your head. Of course, there's exceptions in both. But um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what we found is that there's actually a code to this. How the skin cells know is through this triangulation, just like a GPS device, from head to toe, and how far out you are from the body. For instance, fingers and toes share the same projection code. And the funny part is foreskin does too. Um, but it, that actually validated the rule. Um, so, so there's this code. But the funny thing was that if you looked at this code through this protein view, it was, it was OK, but it was a little information poor. And it was this RNA that filled in the bigger picture. And in fact, that still wasn't enough just because it was interesting and had a pattern. We went and did one step further. And what we found is that this RNA was actually telling proteins what to do and helping establish this. And if we messed up with that RNA, this code got disrupted. And so we now had final evidence that something was really going on here with all this junk. So this 98% of the pie is actually very important. I want to leave you with some thoughts that I don't have time to share all my work. I hope people Google and try and look up um, what's been found. But this is just scratching. The skin was scratching the surface. We now know these, this RNA is critical in cancer and many other diseases. It's universally applicable. They're new genes. When people get bummed out about the genome or start talking bad about it, ask yourself, what, well, maybe they're thinking about it the wrong way. Maybe there's more to it. Um, we now know this is involved with the brain and stem cells very clearly. And the interesting thing is all these things came to a crossroad with epigenetics. 
that the RNA from this wasteland was coming in and helping the proteins guide this around. Now this is a hard job. The same proteins have to change that same template into all those different cells. Um, and with that, I'd just like to leave you thinking maybe just slightly different about the central dogma of biology. Look at it a little bit different and ask what else can RNA do and challenge people that say there's only uh, so many genes in the genome. With that, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.